Now that you've had the opportunity to experience the world above Treeline firsthand, prepare yourself for a whole new series of scenic vistas on the way down. Before we continue our story, let us briefly emphasize these important driving tips. For the trip down, the two most important facts to remember are these. First, use low gear the whole way down. This will allow the transmission and engine to act as a brake and help maintain a slow speed. Remember, low gear is usually indicated by a 1 or an L or L1 on your shifter. Second, don't ride your brakes. A pumping action of the foot pedal allows the brakes to run cooler than does a, just a steady pressure. And never use water to cool your brakes. If they begin to fade, stop at the next pullout and allow them to cool while you enjoy the view. If you're in the fog, please turn on your headlights and remember cars heading down should yield the right of way to the cars on their way up. You may have seen hikers while you're on the summit. Some are day hikers, climbing the mountains or traversing the presidential range by any of the miles of trails that crisscross the slopes. Many begin from the Appalachian Mountain Club's headquarters just south of here in Pinkham Notch. Visible just above the AMC base camp is Tuckerman Ravine, famed for the challenging spring skiing. But skiing in this ravine is not for the faint of heart or casual skier. The head wall and gullies can be more extreme than anyone expects. Other merry wanderers may include the long haul hikers who are traversing the Appalachian Trail. This famous footpath stretches more than 2,100 miles from Georgia through to Maine and crosses the auto road on its way. Even for these folks, reaching the top of New England is a milestone in their journey. The Native American populations of the area, the Abenaki tribe, among others, considered a geokachuk, as they referred to Mount Washington, a sacred place where the Great Spirit lived. So rumor has it that they never climbed the mountain. This entire region was home to great numbers of Native Americans prior to the arrival of European ships and people. But times had begun to change as sparsely populated coastal communities of colonists continued to move inland. One of these early settlers was named Darby Field. After seeing the shining summit from a ship off the coast of Maine, he set out in search of his fortune, enlisting two Native American guides to accompany him into the wilds of this unknown land. Darby set out in a birch bark canoe near Exeter, New Hampshire, paddled up the coastline into the Saco River and up to what is now Glen, New Hampshire. And after obtaining permission from the local tribe elders, Darby Field and his two companions set out on what would become the first ever ascent of this formidable mountain. Now, whether it was riches, glory, adventure, or a combination of all three he sought, Darby and his guides achieved their quest and their place in history more than 350 years ago. After the wake-up call, the mountain rolled over and went back to sleep for about another 150 years. And it was the Crawford family, Abel and then Ethan after him, who finally began housing and then guiding guests around Mount Washington in the 1790s. As the story goes, it is believed that the first visitors who arrived at Crawford's Inn with their express purpose of climbing Mount Washington did so in 1818. Ethan's later journal entry reflects the typical Yankee flair for understatement of this massive effort. He only wrote, My father and I made a footpath from the notch out through the woods, and it was advertised in the newspapers, and we soon began to have a few visitors. And nearly two centuries later, they've never stopped coming. If for nothing else, the Crawford family's legacy is assured by the fact that they cut the first hiking trail up the mountain in 1819, which is still in use today and is the oldest hiking trail in America. Beyond that, the Crawfords cut the first bridle path, which incidentally later became the principal route of the Cog Railroad.
The world above tree line is your world now, and through your care, its rarity will be preserved for the next time that you come or for all those who come after. Now that you've seen the Alpine Zone, you can understand why we are so dedicated to its conservation. To your left, you'll see the Great Gulf Wilderness. This is a glacial cirque of more than 5,500 acres that was officially designated a wilderness area in 1964. This wilderness designation is especially important in that it protects a vast area from any form of man's intrusions. There's no timber harvesting, mining, or buildings of any kind are allowed. With the exception of a few hiking trails, only the forces of nature are at work in the Great Gulf Wilderness. Though it is unmarked today, the halfway point used to be a stopover for guests and horses in the old days. The halfway house offered shelter and refreshments before the last long pull to the top. Now take a minute to think again of the horse teams straining against their harnesses as the drivers spoke commands and encouragement. Horses ruled this road for the first 50 years of its life. In fact, it wasn't until 1912 that the first gas-powered vehicles took over the job of carrying guests up the road. From that time on, the horse-drawn era began to fade from memory and the carriage road eventually became the auto road. The first motor vehicle used to carry passengers, a Thomas Flyer, began the change in 1912, followed in 1917 by a fleet of Pierce Arrows, then Ford Woodies in the 1930s, Internationals in the 1950s and 60s, and finally the vans that you see cruising on the road today. In many ways, the evolution of transportation played itself out right on the path that you now travel. With an average grade of 12%, the auto road presents a manageable challenge for each new generation of transportation technology. In 1904, one of the first motorsports events in America took place right here when the Climb to the Clouds race was held on the very road you're now driving. Mount Washington was a test track of sorts because if a car could prove itself on these unforgiving slopes, it could work anywhere. Many traditional thinkers were not ready to acknowledge the worth of these mechanical contraptions. There was a statewide newspaper, the Manchester Union Leader wrote, The whole thing is an unmitigated nuisance. The lives and property of perfectly helpless people have been menaced for no reason than to provide amusement for total strangers. Some drivers can be trusted, most cannot. If these people think of coming up another year, let them stay in jail a couple of days, and everyone will be the better for it. And as you drive along in your vehicle today, try to imagine these two scenes in your mind. First, see the early cars with their 15 horsepower engines straining to make the grade, and then the other extreme, the high-powered race cars of today that climb to speeds of more than one hundred miles an hour on the same turns that you are negotiating right now. now. Throughout history, the most daring of racers have always tried to capture the speed record on Mount Washington, where horse-drawn wagons took three to four hours to make the ascent. Early autos did it in just under two hours. The most recent racers have shaved the time to well under seven minutes, though they don't take in much of the scenery. If it has been a clear and sunny day for you here today, consider yourself lucky. The weather on Mount Washington is generally more interesting than that, though. It's not that the weather can change quickly here, it's that the mountain seems to generate its own climate and environment. Sure, it, it basically tracks with the four seasons the rest of us know. It just overlaps them more and then mixes them together. So rain, snow, and sun make the rounds based more on random chance than on what the calendar says. Some days there's rain in the valleys, beautiful sun on the mountain, or vice versa. Some days clouds fly by close enough to touch them. Other times an undercast develops where a blanket of clouds 
shroud the lowland and the summits of the taller mountains in the presidential range protrude like islands in a sea of white. Hundreds of inches of snow each year, hurricane force winds on more than a few occasions, fog thick enough to chew. This and more makes up what we call Mount Washington weather. It is both the diversity and extremes in the weather on this mountain that have made it a center of meteorological studies since the mid-1800s. The Hitchcock-Huntington expedition was the first to winter over on the summit in 1870. It was a remote, harsh winter wilderness which exposed these scientists to conditions they couldn't have imagined. The U.S. Signal Corps took over from 1870 until 1892 and experienced many of the same conditions that the current members of the Mount Washington Observatory staff contend with. This journal entry from the logbook details a difficult evening for the early observers. January 27, 1875. Coldest of the season, 46 below. The wind is blowing a hurricane and has done so all through the night past. Had work today to keep warm. The wind and cold penetrate every cranny. Enormous drifts of snow have formed about the building, and as fast as the passage is cut out and the windows cleared, the wind drives in snow to fill out the gaps. The coal is far from being good. It is full of rocks and clinkers. Respectfully suggest that good coal and another heating stove be purchased. If such weather as this is to continue, it would be wicked to keep men in such a dwelling. Sergeant Isaac Burr. It can be assumed that good coal and another stove weren't purchased because winter occupation ceased in 1890. It took 40 years to round up another crew of dedicated weather watchers. In 1932, Alex McKenzie, Joe Dodge, Bob Monahan, and Sal Pagliuca staked a new claim on the summit, and the Mount Washington Observatory began round-the-clock weather observations that still continue to this very day. Then came the day that no one expected. A day that has gone down in history and has yet to be topped. It was April 12th, 1934, that the world's highest recorded winds, 231 miles an hour, blew over the summit of Mount Washington. Pagliuca's logbook entry for that day tells the story. We've been taking turns knocking ice from the anemometer post. Shortly after 1 a.m., I set out to clear the ice again and disappeared into the fog on the roof. I felt the full blast of the 200 mile per hour southeast wind on my face. Kneeling on the platform, I pounded the foot thick ice accumulation with all my strength, but alas, wasn't making much impression on the rough frost. On that day, Mount Washington earned another place in history and was forever nicknamed the home of the world's worst weather. Because of this, Various companies and scientific institutions have tested everything from jet engines to paint and winter clothing. It is because of the reliably harsh extremes of Mount Washington weather that so many different types of tests have been and continue to be done here. In a typical year, the temperature averages 27 degrees. The winds, although averaging 35 miles an hour, exceed hurricane force on more than 100 days out of the year. The summit is in the clouds more than 60% of the time. The snowfall averages 245 inches per year, though more than 500 inches, that's more than 47 feet, fell in the winters of 1968 and 69. Below Tree Line, the Great Glen Trails Outdoor Center uses the road as part of their cross-country trail system. This winter, you can take our specially designed snow coach on the road just above Tree Line for a breathtaking look at the presidential range in winter, and we'll do all the driving. It's a time of unimaginable beauty and deep snow. In fact, on part of the road known as the Cragway, 20 or more feet of snow accumulate each winter. Before the days of heavy equipment, 
pure manpower opened up drifted parts of the road. As the tourist season approached, the road crew armed with only shovels would begin to move mountains of snow that have accumulated in certain areas. Now imagine facing a wall of snow 20 feet deep and 300 feet long, knowing it was your job to break through. This is what the early road crews faced year after year. Today, the job hasn't changed, just the methods of accomplishing it have. Bulldozers and backhoes have taken over where men and shovels once fought the elements. But it's still a lot of work every spring to put a mountain road back in order after a harsh North Country winter. Mount Washington and the Auto Road is as much a destination today as it ever was. There seems to be an almost mystical allure that draws people to its towering heights. For some, it's an opportunity to reach the top of a major mountain and then quietly contemplate the beauty and majesty of their surroundings. For others, it's a place to make history, to set a record or to break a record. This has been the case since Darby Field set out to climb in 1642. Each generation brings a steady stream of challengers. The areas of endeavor are as diverse and unique as the individuals who undertake them. Listen to this sampling of just a few of the records and record breakers through time. 1857. A man counts his steps walking to the top, 16,925. 1861, the road opens and Colonel Joseph Thompson drives the first horse-drawn vehicle up Mount Washington. 1875, Harlan Amon runs down the road in 54 minutes. 1887, an all-time record for horse-drawn vehicles is set by Charles O'Hara with a time of one hour, nine minutes. 1899, Freeland O'Stanley drives the first automobile up the road in two hours and 10 minutes. 1904, Harry Harkness sets a record in the first climb to the clouds auto race of 24 minutes, 37.6 seconds. 1907, the first recorded round trip is made on skis. 1923, the automobile hill climb record stands at 17 minutes. 1924, a Harley Davidson motorcycles ascends in 15 minutes. 1926, Arthur Walden drives the first dog team to the summit. 1932, Florence Clark becomes the first and only woman to drive a dog team solo to the summit. 1934, the still current world record wind of 231 miles an hour is recorded on the summit. 1938, an automobile record of 12 minutes 17 seconds is set by Lem Ladd in a Ford V8 special. 1950s, Alden Weigel of Walpole runs up the road, rides down the cog, and hikes up Tuckerman Ravine all in 14 hours. Weigel then goes on to climb the road barefoot and blindfolded, then backwards, then pushing a wheelbarrow carrying a hundred pound sack of sugar in it. 1975, an alternative energy regatta finds an odd assortment of vehicles powered by wood, steam, garbage, and chicken manure winding their way up Mount Washington. 1998, climb to the clouds, car race record stands at six minutes, 42 seconds by Frank Sprongle driving an Audi Quattro. 2003, a Segway from Heritage, New Hampshire is ridden to the summit. Now, less scientific-minded have been those who have used roller skates, llamas, skateboards, and unicycles as a method to reach the top. One New Hampshire man even claims to hold the record for the most diverse array of ascents, hiking up as Darby Field did in 1642, a tire with Indian guards, riding up in the road's own six-horse mountain wagon, 
in a 1917 Pierced Arrow, a 1938 Ford Woody, a modern day auto road van, a motorcycle, a race car, snowmobile, snowcat, snow coach, jeep, and a convertible. It seems every year someone shows up asking permission to use the road to be the first or the fastest at something on Mount Washington. Besides the climb to the clouds, special events include the Mount Washington Road Race. It's a classic foot race that annually draws a field of a thousand runners, the best of whom can run the grueling 7.6 mile course in under an hour. You've now joined with explorers, adventurers, competitors, climbers, families, and travelers from throughout time and around the world who have found themselves drawn to the top of this mountain, to the place the Indians called a Giacachuk. The memories you will take with you are yours forever. This, above all, is the glory of Mount Washington, that it gives absolutely anyone at any age a chance to sit with friends and family, get some perspective on the world we live in from a place unlike any other, to breathe deeply the mountain air and reflect briefly on those who came before and will come after, perhaps members of your own family. Enjoy the rest of your day and your visit to the White Mountains. Visit us again sometime for another drive in your own vehicle or take a guided tour in one of our stages. When you reach the bottom, come across the street. Take advantage of services at the Glen House Base Area. The Glenview Cafe has a spectacular view of the mountain you've just climbed and serves homemade soups, sandwiches, and other goodies. The Red Barn Museum features horse-drawn and automotive stages on display, as well as historical memorabilia and a slideshow and video, all for free. To continue your day of enjoyment and adventure, you can take in these magnificent surroundings in a whole different way with a visit to the Great Glen Trails Outdoor Center right across the street. Enjoy biking for the whole family on wide, gentle sloping trails, an indoor climbing wall, easy walks on rolling paths, a picnic in a field of wildflowers, or just plain relaxing with unbelievable views. The Great Glen Trails Outdoor Center has this and more. A full schedule of summer and winter programs is always planned at Great Glen. For example, spend the afternoon on a guided kayak or canoe trip on the Androscoggin River. Or even more adventure, take a full day to explore the natural wonders of the Lake Umbegog Wildlife Refuge while paddling with one of our guides. Also, stop in our outfitter shop and be prepared for your own outdoor fun. Besides bike rentals, you'll find a wide selection of items from sunglasses and postcards to high-tech outerwear, biking and paddling accessories. And the best part is you're already here. Simply come across the street to the base lodge and you'll find the Great Glen Trails Outdoor Center. Remember, in the wintertime, those same great trails make for the best cross-country skiing and snowshoeing in the North Country. Continue your experience in the great outdoors right here. Come on over for a look and more information. Well, that's about it. If you're not at the base area, you will be soon. We hope you've enjoyed your adventure above Treeline, and thank you again for journeying with us today on our road to the sky. <laughs>